estará conectado el doctor Greg Stone. Sí. Eh, él eh, el día de hoy nos va a hablar um, acerca de los nuevos paradigmas en términos de transformar el tratamiento isquémico tanto en la placa estable como en la placa vulnerable. Please, Dr. Stone, uh, we enlighten us with uh, your talk. It will be very interesting to change the paradigm that we have right now because uh, we already know that with, um, with the possibility we have right now with uh, technology, uh, uh, things are going to change in respect uh, of what we saw first in the prospect trial on uh, in unstable patients and non-limiting lesions on what you have on the new trials that you're developing right now. And also, um, some of those findings are going to explain also the, uh, the findings of ischemia trial, the complete trial, and the many others like a prospect trial and the subanalysis. Please, Greg, go ahead. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, great to be able to participate in Selassie. Gosh, I've come to the meeting so many, many times, and uh, it's just great um, uh, to be able to, in this world, participate um, uh, virtually. And thank you for the uh, honor of delivering this keynote address. So I hope to really present some very forward-looking uh, thinking to you all, and I'm sure this will lead to a lot of great discussion. Uh, as we consider transitioning our treatment from thinking just about ischemic lesions to vulnerable plaque. So these are my relevant disclosures. So uh, let me ask the question, and that is, in whom has revascularization, whether it's PCI or bypass surgery, been proven to prevent cardiovascular death or myocardial infarction? And I would say acute myocardial infarction, definitely. Left main disease, I think most people would not argue about possibly extensive multivessel disease, and probably patients with reduced LVEF. So maybe this is about 25% of all the revascularization procedures that have been done. But for the majority of those that have been done, we're really treating mainly symptoms and about 75%. Maybe there's a few benefits in terms of prognosis, but they're, they're pretty small. So, for example, um, uh, you know, our whole world was rocked more than a decade ago when the COURAGE trial came out in patients with stable coronary artery disease, randomized to PCI versus medical therapy, absolutely no difference in death or myocardial infarction with follow-up out to seven years. We saw the same thing with Berry 2 d um, in diabetic patients, and now um, uh, with um, bare metal stents and first-generation drug-eluting stents, whereas COURAGE was all bare metal stents or balloon angioplasty. So later technology, but still no overall difference in death or myocardial infarction, especially when you look at the PCI stratum of somewhat less complex patients. So maybe the problem was we weren't treating enough high-risk patients because we know that there are uh, uh, hundreds of thousands, well, actually there's, there's dozens of studies and hundreds of thousands of patients that shown that the greater the amount of ischemia on a quantitative test like a SPECT or a PET, the greater the incidence of both cardiac death and myocardial infarction. And this is a very, very uh, often quoted study from Cedars-Sinai Medical Center showing that if you look with quantitative SPECT, if you look at the red line in medical therapy, that the greater the amount of total ischemic myocardium, the increased rate of cardiac death. Um, now, they looked at a group of patients who happened to re be revascularized in this non-randomized study, and the um, uh, patients that were revascularized had lower mortality once you got to about 10% ischemic myocardium. So this suggested that, again, that would be amount of ischemic myocardium where revascularization might make a difference, and this really led us to design the ischemia trial where we only enrolled patients with stable coronary syndromes and at least approximately 10% of the ischemic myocardium, consider it considered moderate or severe um, uh, um, uh, ischemia. But of course, you know the results of the ischemia trial. There was no difference overall in cardiovascular death or myocardial infarction. Um, now at six months, there was a slight hazard to revascularization, and this was with PCI or cabbage, 
But then the curves did cross a little bit. So by the time you got to four years, there was a slight reduction. But overall, when you look at the hazard over a four to five year perspective, there really wasn't any significant difference in cardiovascular death or MI, despite these patients having at least moderate ischemia. Now, maybe, as I said, there's a little bit of a benefit. And if you look at the latest and greatest um, a meta-analysis of elective revascularization and stable coronary disease. This is with PCI or surgery with the longest term follow-up. 25 trials, almost 20,000 patients randomized to revascularization versus medical therapy with a mean of 5.7 year follow-up. You can see there is a small reduction in cardiac death, about 21%. That's about 0.3% per year. And if you look at spontaneous, that is non-procedural myocardial infarctions, it's about a 0.5% per year reduction. So yes, maybe treating stable CAD slightly improves the prognosis, but it's not much. So the real question is, since these differences are small, can we do better? And why are we not doing better? We're revascularizing patients with extensive coronary disease. Why are we not preventing death and myocardial infarction? And the real reason is, is that for the most part, we're treating the wrong lesions, okay? So we, this is um, the type of lesion that we normally treat. This is a, you know, a, a moderately severe right coronary stenosis in a patient who's got angina. And if you look at this pathologically, it looks like this. It's what I would call garden variety atherosclerosis or pathologic intimal thickening, sometimes fibrotic or fibrocalcific disease. And these lesions can be quite obstructive so they can be ischemia producing and therefore they can cause angina and angina related type symptoms. They can worsen quality of life, but they're very stable. They rarely go on to thrombose or occlude. And this is most of what we are treating. In contrast, we've learned from pathologic studies that the types of lesions that tend to cause myocardial infarctions and sudden cardiac death due to thrombosis tend to be non-obstructive. There are more this type of lesion that are called thin cap fibroatheromas. And what these lesions have is rather than being just fibrotic or um, with mixed types of tissue, they have a well-formed necrotic core consisting of cholesterol and cholesterol esters and dead inflammatory cells. And that necrotic core is separated from the lumen by a thin fibrous cap. And that thin fibrous cap is metabolically active. And when that cap ruptures, for a variety of reasons. The prothrombotic contents of the necrotic core are released to the bloodstream, and that can cause a sudden thrombosis. So you can take this stenosis here, which might have been a 40% stenosis, and it can go to 100% stenosis in the matter of minutes. And these are tend to be the lesions that are not ischemia producing that we're not tending to treat. This is what those lesions look like in cross-section. And you can see the well-formed necrotic core here. You can actually see the cholesterol clefts and the very thin fibrous cap. In fact, it looks like the necrotic core is bulging out of the lesion. In fact, in cross-section, it looks a lot like a volcano. And we often use the volcano analogy for vulnerable plaque because on the surface, you can't tell what's beneath the surface of the volcano, which may be just about ready to erupt. And obviously when you get an erupting volcano, you've got a real problem. But on the surface, everything looks quiescent, and you don't know if it's going to stay quiescent for decades or if it's going to erupt in the next day and cause havoc. All right. Now, we know that we can now identify these vulnerable plaques using a variety of invasive imaging tools, both grayscale, radio frequency IVIS, um, uh, optical coherence tomography, and near-infrared spectroscopy. We can separate basically lesions into their five major pathologic types. Fibrocalcific, fibrous, and pathologic animal thickening, which are the stable types of lesions. And then the fibroatheromas, those that have a necrotic core. And when the necrotic core has a thin fibrous cap, it's a thin cap fibroatheroma, and those are the really dangerous ones. Now, we now have at least nine really good uh, prospective studies suggesting that using these intravascular imaging techniques, and as I'll show you also um, non-invasive uh, computed tom tomographic analysis, that we can identify non-full limiting plaques 
that place patients at risk for future adverse cardiovascular events from those plaques having rapid lesion progression. So, and, and we were the first ones to really have studied this in the prospect study using multimodality imaging in this natural history study. And what you remember we did was we took about 700 patients who presented with an acute coronary syndrome, and then we, they underwent successful PCI of all the flow limiting lesions. And you're left with patients with only mild atherosclerosis, as you could tell on an angiogram. And then we did three vessel imaging with, with a virtual histology, radio frequency IVIS. We characterized more than 3000 plaques at baseline. And then we followed these patients longitudinally for about a median of 3.4 years. And when we had a subsequent event, we then looked back to see what kind of plaque caused that event. So here's how that worked. So this is a patient who presented, you can see with a subtotal LED lesion, trust me that LED was treated. And then once the LED was treated, we did three vessel virtual histology imaging of the LED, the circumflex and the right coronary artery. Now here I show you the circumflex and I can tell you that 51 weeks later, this patient developed a non ST segment elevation MI attributed to the circumflex. And so I ask you which of these lesions likely cause that circumflex infarct. And most people's eye go to about the 40%, maybe 50% narrowing in the middle of the circumflex um, artery or large obtuse marginal branch. And here's what happened 51 weeks later. That stenosis didn't change at all, but this 10% stenosis that was a little more distal, you could see now has a large thrombus in it. And that caused the non ST segment elevation MI. And you could see by QCA, the diameter stenosis increased from 29% to 71% just 51 weeks later. So now we go back to baseline and we say, what did the core lab find? And the core lab, when it looked at this circumflex artery, actually found three discrete lesions. And you can see those three discrete lesions um, all had a lot of red. The red is the necrotic core. Uh, and you could see this particular lesion, which is the number one, um, is read in the core laboratory as having a diameter stenosis of 28.6%, 6.8 millimeter length. It had a plaque burden of 76%. Even though it looked like a 10% angiographic stenosis, look how much plaque is in that lesion. So the angiogram is a terrible discriminator. You just can't tell how much plaque there is. Um, the minimal luminal area though was 5.3 millimeters squared. So not flow limiting. And this was read by the core lab as a thick cap fibroatheroma in this particular case. Now, when we looked at what the correlates were of all these 3000 non-culper lesions becoming unstable during three and a half year follow-up, the number one predictor was plaque burden, okay? And we looked, we had thousands and thousands of lesions with less than 40% plaque burden. We didn't even count them, okay? And not a single one of those plaques led to an event within three and a half years. In fact, if the plaque burden was 40 to 60%, the rate of those lesions becoming unstable per plaque was about 0.5%. When you start to get to 60%, and then really when you get to 70% or greater plaque burden, then you can see you've got about a one out of 10 chance of those lesions becoming unstable. So the mean baseline QCA diameter stenosis was 32% of these lesions that became unstable. So again, even though they angiographically look mild, the ones that become unstable have a lot of plaque. So we exploded what then was a very, very common myth. And that was that vulnerable plaques are mild. Vulnerable plaques are not mild. They actually are severe plaques, but they just look mild angiographically because the angiogram is a terrible discriminator of the amount of plaque burden for a variety of reasons, including the fact that, that plaques have Glagovian remodeling. When they develop a lot of plaque, a lot of uh, uh, atherosclerosis, the vessel positively expands, it positively remodels. And, it, and it's not until you get to about a 40% cross-sectional area narrowing that there's any encroachment at all in the lumen. So we have to stop relying on the angiogram. You can have a lot of plaque anywhere in the coronary tree in an angiogram that appears nearly normal. But large plaques are not enough. It really depends on the type of large plaque. So this is the outcomes of all the plaques that we identified that had a 70% or greater plaque burden. 
I told you those had an overall 10% risk of events. Well, if it was a 70% blackbird and there was also called a thin cap fibroatheroma by the core lab, now it's got a 16% chance. If it was called a thick cap fibroatheroma, like that example I showed you, it's an 8.7% chance. And if it's got any of the other types of more stable patterns, pathologic animal thickening, fibrotic or fibrocalcific disease, now it's a 2.6% chance, which is not even an increased risk compared to any other plaques with less amount of plaque burden. So it's gotta be a large plaque and it's gotta be a fibroatheroma, particularly a thin calf fibroatheroma. We recently completed the PROSPECT-2 study. And in PROSPECT-2, we basically did a very similar type of study, but used but did 900 patients and use NIRS IVIS imaging. So near infrared spectroscopy, the most accurate tool we have to identify lipid. And here we also insisted that we have FFR or IFR documentation that all the lesions were non-flow limiting. So here, for example, is a patient who presented with a, um, a distal right coronary artery subtotal stenosis. And you can see where I've got a dotted line distally and it says culprit stent. Um, and here's what that right coronary looked like after the stent was placed. So we did three vessel nears IVIS imaging of the LED circ and right coronary artery. And I'm telling you that something happened to this right coronary artery in the future. So I show you three different areas that I call non-culprit lesions one and two, which are 10 to 20% stenotic, nothing at all severe. And this vessel now is an FFR of 0.94. So not full limiting at all. And so what happened to this uh, vessel over time? Well, that's what happened. Three years later, that 10% stenosis proximally suddenly presents with a subtotal stenosis, 95% stenosis. And when you look at back at baseline, what did that lesion look like? Well, here's the entire vessel. If you look at the um, a map in, in red in the bottom below the angiograms, this lays the whole vessel out. And basically what near infrared spectroscopy does is that red is not lipid and yellow is lipid. And where there's a lot of lipid, we measure the maximum amount of lipid over any four millimeter segment and a score of 687 is basically 68.7% lipid. And that lipid spot is right where that arrow is, okay? And that's the hallmark of a fibroatheroma. <laughs> if you look at it in cross-section right at that spot, you can see that the plaque burden was 80.1% and the MLA was 3.8 millimeters squared. Despite the fact that that angiogram looked like about a 10 at 20% stenosis at most, and the FFR was 0.94. So this was a huge bulky plaque and it was a fibroatheroma um, as documented by the intense amount of lipid and that any progression over time. When we looked in Prospect 2, which was recently published in The Lancet, you could see that the two biggest predictors were again, the amount of plaque burden and two, the amount of lipid. So you could see that there was an exponential increase in the per lesion rate um, as the amount of plaque burden increased. And uh, um, this was a more healthy Scandinavian population. So the rates were somewhat even lower than in prospect two. But when you start to get to um, 80% and 80, uh, above 70%, the risk increases. And particularly when you get to 80 and 85%, now you're up to a very high per lesion rate over about a three year follow up. And um, the maximum lipid core burden index over four millimeters also was strongly related. And you could see, we defined a lipidic lesion as greater than 325, but of course it's a continuous relationship as shown in the red line. The blue bars show you the histogram of the numbers of lesions. The red bars show you the event rates per that lesion type. And when you get to the really lipidic lesions, you know, again, it starts going up at about 300. And then the higher the amount of lipid, the more the event rate um, is. And when you, real, when you have two of those events, uh, two of those lesion types, the plaque burden greater than 70% and a max LCBI of greater than 325, then you get an exponential increase in the per lesion risk. So again, not enough to just have a lot of plaque, you gotta have plaque plus lipid. Another study that looked at Nears IVIS was the lipid rich plaque study by Ron Waxman. And if you look at my multivariable analysis, from prospect one and prospect two in LRP, you get extraordinarily concordant results. 
as to what type of plaque features predict those plaques to become unstable within about three years. And it, it's a VH TICFA, which was in prospect one. It's a very lipidic plaque, which LRP used a 400 cutoff. We used a 325 cutoff. And then it's plaque burn greater than 70%. So those are the most important risk factors. MLA in prospect um, was borderline significant and uh, was significant. And MLA was borderline significant in both prospect two and LRP. So it's really a thin cap fibroatheroma uh, with a lot of plaque and a lot of lipid, not the MLA. And then finally, OCT has shown us the same thing. I like this study from Elvin Ketty, um, the combined OCT FFR study, because here he, he studied diabetic patients um, with an intermediate lesion uh, with an FFR of greater than 0 0.8. So 40 to 80% angiographic stenosis, but the uh, FFR was negative. And three quarters of these patients had stable coronary disease. And if you defined um, a, a thin cap fibroatheroma, okay, as a less than 65 micron fibers cap thickness with a lipid arc of greater than 90 degrees, you could see that those lesions had a four times higher likelihood of causing a MACE event than non-thin cap fibroatheromas. So all of this is very, very consistent. So now let me come back to um, this issue about ischemia. So why does ischemia lead to a high rate of cardiac death and myocardial infarction? This always bothered me. Uh, you know, ischemia, you know, you exercise, you get a little bit of angina, you stop exercising and it goes away. It's kind of like if you over-exercise your bicep muscle with a heavy weight, it starts to burn when you get anaerobic metabolism. Then you stop the exercise, and in 15, 20 seconds, the burn goes away. Same thing's happening in the heart. So why does that lead to a high rate of cardiac death in MI? And the reason has been answered by CTA. Um, and the fact is, the more ischemia, the more likely there are to be plaques with vulnerable plaque characteristics. So this was a study from Lee, who looked at 772 vessels in 299 patients that had both CTA and FFR. And they looked at six different CTA high-risk plaque characteristics. In particular, the ones that are the most important are the large plaque burden, low attenuating plaque, positive remodeling, napkin ring signs, spotty calcification, and a small MLA. And what they found was they looked at the number of high-risk lesions according to the FFR. And the lower the FFR, the higher the number of vulnerable plaque characteristics. So what that means is, yes, ischemic lesions tend to be bulkier plaques and they tend to be more likely fibroatheromas. It's not the ischemia that's causing the harm, it's the vulnerable plaque. And in fact, of course, what they did in this study, all the lesions that had an FFR of less than 0.8 were treated and those that had an FFR greater than 0.8 were followed medically. And when they looked at the prognosis, of the lesions that were followed medically with an FFR greater than 0.8, and they broke down those lesions according to whether or not there were three or more high-risk plaque characteristics, that is very vulnerable lesions versus not, the very vulnerable lesions had a four times higher rate of MACE over a five-year follow-up. So it's all consistent. It's not the ischemia, it's the vulnerable plaque characteristics, whether or not the patient is ischemic. So, Let's look at what this has to do with lesion selection. We know in stable coronary disease, we can use FFR or IFR, and we can do a pretty good job at identifying flow-limiting lesions, those that are likely to cause symptoms. In acute coronary syndromes, though, we don't do as good a job with FFR and IFR. So this is the flower mi study, which is a very important study. They took patients uh, with an acute SD segment elevation myocardial infarction, uh, with multivessel disease, and they asked, well, well, let's decide the other lesions. Should we treat them according to physiology or angiography? And so in the physiology group, they only revascularize the other lesions if the FFR was less than or equal to 0.8. And in the um, angiography guided group, they principally um, uh, uh, treated the lesions with a diameter stenosis that they thought was greater than 70%. And here, unlike the FAME trials, there was no significant difference in long-term outcomes. And in fact, cardiovascular rehospitalizations were greater in the FFR-guided group 
than in the angio-guided group. And in the FFR-guided group, they deferred PCI in 66.2% of patients. So they didn't treat as aggressively. In FAME, that was safe to do, but not in patients after myocardial infarction. And what actually happened, if you dig deep further, in those deferred lesions in the FFR group, they had a very high rate of myocardial infarction. 5.6% of those deferred lesions had an infarct within one year. So in patients with acute coronary syndromes, they're more likely to have thin cap fibroatheromas. They've got ongoing inflammation, and it's not safe to defer based on physiology. Angiography, if anything, is a better guide. But is angiography enough? Well, let's look at the complete trial. The complete trial used angiography in patients with multivessel disease after a STEMI. And it took those patients, and they randomized the non-culprit, the non-infarct culprit lesions to either treat them or not treat them. And they basically used the 70% diameter stenosis cutoff. And they did find out very clearly that you should treat non-culprit severe angiographic lesions. And the rates of particularly myocardial infarction, but also unstable angina and revascularization were lower um, uh, substantially at one year and through five years by treating these angiographically severe lesions. So that's great, but can we do better? And the answer is we can do better because by now you know that the reason they reduced myocardial infarctions and unstable angina is because a lot of those severe lesions were vulnerable plaques. But they did an OCT substudy, which is very, very interesting. They did OCT in a, a, a large segment of their patients. And they found that if you looked at thin cap fibroatheromas, two thirds of the patients had them. And one third of the lesions were thin cap fibroatheromas. Now the obstructive lesions, those that were 70% or greater, about 35% of those were thin cap fibroatheromas. But the non-obstructive lesions that were less than 70%, a quarter of those were thin cap fibroatheromas. So again, the more severe, the more likely the TICFA. But on the other hand, the non-severe lesions are also likely to harbor TICFAs in one in four cases. And in fact, if you look at the denominators, 56% of all the thin cap fibroatheromas in this population were in non-obstructive lesions. And if you looked at those TICFAs compared to the TICFAs in the obstructive lesions, you could see the lipid arcs were just as severe, the thin thinness of the fibrous cap was just as severe. So these are really dangerous lesions. So as, as good as they did in complete, they could have, in my opinion, further lower the MI rate by treating more of the TICFAs. So the first lesson is that we've got to see beyond the angiogram. When you see a vessel that's got mild atherosclerosis or even no atherosclerosis, like this 10% stenosis in the mid-right, you've got you to differentiate the stable atherosclerotic plaque, which is inactive and not inflamed from the vulnerable atherosclerotic plaque, which is inflamed and active and has a thin cap fibroatheroma. And fortunately, we now have the imaging tools to be able to do that, particularly good in the cath lab, but also with CTA outside of the cath lab. So then the final question is, well, what do we do when we see these lesions? And they're very, very common. So this is a very interesting study, the SCAPA study, they performed a CTA in 25,182 asymptomatic people in Sweden, aged 50 to 64, without any known coronary disease. These are just the walking well in Sweden, 50 to 64 years of age. And they found out that 42% of them had atherosclerosis. In fact, uh, about only 5% of patients had severe atherosclerosis, a plaque that was greater than 50%. Okay, but a lot of them have some atherosclerosis. So like here's a woman, 61, who used to be a smoker, then she quit, otherwise was feeling great. And here a CTA showed a vulnerable plaque in her proximal LAD. This is a positive remodel plaque. It's got low Hounsfeld units. And in fact, it's probably got a prior plaque rupture in it. So even though they weren't supposed to do anything about this, the doc saw this and got very nervous. So he capped this patient. And here's what he found a 20% stenosis in the proximal LAD. And he said, and she feels great. She's on no medications. She's on, got no risk factors currently. And so he did an FFR 
or an IFR, and the IFR is perfectly normal, 0.96. But he's still nervous about it because the CTA suggested it was a vulnerable plaque, so he did a Nears IVIS. And guess what? It is a vulnerable plaque. It's got a plaque burden of 74%, and it's got 50% lipid burden at its worth spot. So what do you do about this? Do you leave this 20% stenosis alone in this asymptomatic patient? Well, today we don't have any data at all that says you should treat this. So here's a similar type of patient, a 66-year-old diabetic who got cath because she had atypical angina. She was already treated with aspirin and atorvastatin, and her LDL was well-controlled. And they cathed her because of the atypical angina. This was all they found, the only lesion anywhere in her coronary tree. So they did an FFR and it was 0.88. So it was normal. So they left it alone. And three months later, this patient thrombosed it and developed a STEMI. And now they do the OCT at the time of the STEMI. And it's 360 degrees of lipid with a plaque rupture and thrombus. So should that have been treated when it presented? Well, none other than Eugene Braunwald, all the way back in 2006, more than 15 years ago, suggested that maybe we should be treating about thinking about prophylactically treating these. He said we should be using risk factors to screen patients, and then patients who have um, a lot of risk factors and perhaps additional tests, and I would say maybe a positive CRP, should undergo non-invasive imaging for vulnerable plaques. And that non-invasive imaging, at least on today's uh, data would be a CTA. Then he said maybe those that are at really high risk based on the CTA should undergo invasive imaging for vulnerable plaque. Today, that would be either Nears IVIS or OCT. And perhaps those that are very high should get some new treatment. Well, what is that new treatment? He didn't uh, even specify, but it's either pharmacologic intensification or maybe a stent or a scaffold. And because of time, I'm not going to go into um, all the studies of pharmacologic intensification, but there's been four randomized trials looking at high dose statins and PCSK9 inhibitors. And all four trials show that um, uh, intense lipid lowering can stabilize vulnerable plaque characteristics, can reduce the amount of lipid, and can thicken the fibers cap. But we're interventional cardiologists, so should we treat these things interventionally? They're, again, very often not flow limiting. Well, we and others have the hypothesis that if you put a stent on a vulnerable plaque, you induce a certain amount of neointimal hyperplasia, right? Restenosis. Um, and that creates a new thick cap over what used to be a very thin cap. And maybe that new thick cap would stabilize the lesion. And we certainly can identify these types of lesions in the cath lab now. And Pedro Marino did some very exquisite animal studies in which he created what uh, uh, very foam cell rich lesions with thin fibrous caps that look like thin cap fibroatheromas. And when you put a drug eluting stent on those, you create a new fibrous cap or a so called neo cap over the old thin fibrous cap. So we did a pilot study called the Prospect Absorb Randomized Trial. And this is the first randomized trial to test the feasibility and safety of treating vulnerable plaques. And we used uh, uh, the bioresorbable scaffold, the first generation of Zorb, which of course is no longer commercially available. We took 182 patients within Prospect 2 that had at least a 65% plaque burden. So that alone qualified it as a vulnerable plaque, but it was non-flow limiting, negative FFR or IFR. And we randomized them to an Absorb versus medical therapy alone. And then we followed them for two years. And it, uh, we followed them for, I'm sorry, for five years, but at 25 months, we brought them back for follow-up angiography and NIRS intravascular imaging. And the question was, could we safely make a new thick fibrous cap and could we enlarge the lumen without adverse events? And here's what we found. If you looked at the randomized group, the MLA increased from around three millimeters squared at baseline to 6.9 millimeters squared in the BVS group compared to staying about the same uh, at 25 months in the control group. And we did create a neo cap of 210 micron thickness um, by IVIS imaging over those previously vulnerable plaques. And we also delipidated the plaque through the PCI process. What used to be a median uh, of, of max of CBI over 4 mm of 327 decreased to 62 at follow-up. 
Now, this trial wasn't powered for clinical events, but interestingly, when we followed those lesions and we looked at the randomized lesion-related MACE rates, those lesions that were treated with medical therapy only had an about 11% four-year rate of adverse events compared to only 4% with BVS treatment. And there were no scaffold lesions, in, no scaffold thromboses um, in these very soft lesions. So I'll show you an example, which is an interesting example, because this is a case where a patient served as his own control. Here was a patient who presented with a non-STEMI due to an LED stenosis, and the LED was treated. The patient then had two other moderate lesions, and these are both about 60% stenoses, one in the uh, distal circumflex and one in the right. And they were both negative by FFR. In fact, the FFR was 0 0.90 in both, exactly. So these are going to be treated medically. Uh, they underwent NIRS uh, intravascular imaging with NIRS IVUS imaging, and they were both thin cap fibroatheromas. They both had, I'm sorry, they were both fibroatheromas anyway. They both had a lot of lipid and they both had a very large plaque burn. So when there were two lesions like this, the protocol said the operator should randomize only one lesion and they should choose the one that supplies the most of my of myocardium. So the operator decided to randomize the right coronary lesion and treat the circumflex medically. And the right coronary lesion got randomized in this case to a BVS rather than medical treatment. So here's the right coronary before and after the scaffold. And you can see immediately what happens is that it went from, um, uh, again, a max LCBI 459 to, to almost no lipid at all, zero. And you can see the scaffold results not great. That's despite a four millimeter non-compliant balloons. These first generation scaffolds weren't terrific, but the scaffold area is 5.2 millimeters squared compared to 1.8 millimeters squared at baseline. So the patient did well um, until uh, nine months. And in nine months, the patient presented with unstable angina. And the patient was brought back to the cath lab. The right coronary looked fine. I'm not gonna show it to you. But what was the problem? The problem was the circumflex. And this was the non-randomized lesion that was treated with medical therapy. And here you can see it at baseline. And what happened in nine months? It totally occluded. So that, uh, um, again, large lipidic plaque, severe plaque burden, 94% lipid occluded at nine months with the best medical therapy in a low-risk Scandinavian population. So the operator decided, you know, that's gone. And I'm going to try to treat the patient with antianginal meds. He upped the antianginal meds and the patient was fine. So the patient did okay with only mild angina through 25 months. He brought the patient back for follow-up angiography at 25 months. The circumflex looked the same. So I'm not going to show that to you, but I'll show you the right coronary artery at 25 months. Here was a baseline. Here it was immediately after the BVS. And then in the right panel, here's what it looked like at 25 months. And you can see there's essentially no angiographic restenosis. You can see the lumen area is 4.8 millimeters squared. So there's a thin amount of neointhema that reduced it from 5.2 millimeters squared to 4.8 millimeters squared. And the scaffold area, if anything, is a little larger at 6.6 .6 millimeters squared. So this vulnerable plaque was stabilized by BVS, whereas the non-treated circumflex vulnerable plaque went on to occlude and cause an ACS event. So my last slide, where are we today? We're gonna, you're gonna, when you start looking for these patients, they're all over. Should you revascularize these lesions? Here's the last case I'll show you. This was a 65 year old man with exertional dyspnea and he was a prior smoker. He had hypertension, he had hypercholesterolemia. He was already on high dose of torvastatin and his LDL was pretty good. It was 68 milligrams per deciliter. He underwent a stress echo um, because he had exertional dyspnea, though no angina symptoms. And he had one millimeter of exertional ST depression, but a normal resting and stress EF. So the operator decided, well, you know, he does have some funny symptoms and he did have a little EKG change. So let me cath him. So he cath him and the circ and the right were perfectly smooth, but he did have these 10 to 20% proximal and middle LAD stenoses. So now what do you do? Well, he did have exertional dyspnea, so the operator said, let's do an FFR. And the FFR with the pressure transducer here was 0 0.88. So these are non-full limiting lesions. Who knows what the dyspnea is, but it's probably not due to these lesions. So now what do you do? Well, he's got an LDL of 68. 
just continue to modify his risk factors, right? Well, this operator said, I want to look at these plaques a little bit more. So he did Nears Ivis. And both of these plaques are vulnerable plaques. They are both bulky plaques, greater than 70%, and they have a lot of lipid in them. So, uh, you know, there's probably about a 20% chance within a three or four year period that this patient's going to have an acute coronary syndrome in his LAD, the so-called widowmaker, because of these lesions. And is already on high dose of with an LDL of 68 milligrams. So what do you do? Do you put the patient on um, a PCSK9 inhibitor and get the LDL down to 20? Do you go ahead and stent these? Um, what do you tell the patient? Well, at least as regarding stenting, I think the answer is not today, but tomorrow maybe. And we need um, a large scale, uh, adequately powered randomized trials about treating vulnerable plaque lesions. So again, if I was to try to give you any take home messages, think beyond the angiogram, Ischemia causes symptoms. We treat severe lesions that are ischemia producing to relieve symptoms. But if we want to prevent cardiac death and myocardial infarction, we may do that a little bit by treating flow limiting lesions because some of those are vulnerable plaques, but there's a lot more vulnerable plaques that are not flow limiting. And those are the ones we've got to start targeting in the future. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for very enlightening kind of presentation which uh, lead us to think um, about uh, just ischemia. When we're treating ischemia, we're just treating symptoms. And we, when we are treating an acute coronary syndrome, we are treating a much more complex kind of patients. And we cannot easily know if this patient is going to develop uh, new events and that it's very important and that also lead us to the the, the important role that has imaging and uh, la siguiente por favor imaging and and pasa la siguiente porque estas de isquemia ya las hemos visto solo quiero ir algunas cuantas eh, diapositivas Tenemos el privilegio de la que sigue. Por favor, esta diapositiva es interesante y es importante porque nos lleva a que la tecnología y hoy en día, contando con la tomografía, nos va a llevar a muchas, muchas soluciones antes de llegar a la sala de hemodinámica. Porque este trabajo ya se está haciendo hoy en día en ALS con Carlos Colet y no solamente en ALS hay un protocolo que involucra casi a ocho o nueve centros, eh, muchos de ellos en Europa, en Inglaterra, en Escocia, en, en algunas otras partes, pero con la simple tomografía llevada a la sala de cateterismo y fusionada con eh, la fluoroscopía, podemos eh, tener antes la significancia hemodinámica con un FFR hecho por CT, podemos tener la predicción de los resultados tratando con un stent, eh, podemos ver cuál es la composición de la placa, podemos seleccionar el catéter, ver cuál es la predicción más importante y más fácil de trabajar, sobre todo en pacientes con bifurcaciones, con tronco, con muchas cosas. Y eh, eh, aparte, eh, la composición de la placa, como dije, y eh, los medir también de antemano el tamaño y el diámetro del stent que vamos a necesitar y saber cuándo vamos a necesitar otro tipo de herramientas como un debulking, como una eh, OCT dentro de la sala o como un IBUS. La que sigue, por favor. Eh, solo quiero mostrar esta diapositiva porque esta diapositiva es ampliamente enriquecedora porque el planning de lo que viene Es un planning muy interesante que tiene que ver con la tomografía previa, con el arco de calcio, con la profundidad del calcio, con la longitud del calcio, con el territorio involucrado, como ven en, en, la cuarta, eh, en el cuarto rectángulo, con la distribución del calcio y con la fisiología coronaria en las últimas dos que nos puede predecir hacia dónde vamos y qué vamos a hacer.
Como nos faltan 13 minutos, yo quisiera mejor, teniendo aquí a Natalia, a Carlos, al doctor Leiva y al doctor eh, 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 Alfaro Marchena, preguntarle, bueno, empezaré por Natalia, primero las damas, este, hacia dónde vamos con los protocolos nuevos para discernir y cuáles son estos protocolos nuevos para discernir qué pacientes posiblemente tengan que ser tratados cuando tienen una placa vulnerable con un TICPA menor de 0.65 y por qué. Muchas gracias al doctor Stone. ¿Está conectado aún? Doctor Stone, your, your, your presentation was amazing. I have heard you so many times and I enjoy it every time. Um, Thank you. I feel like every time I hear these topics is like we have done a lot of physiology in the past and I think we will be doing a lot more imaging coming, like a lot more. Because now um, all of this is telling us like the vulnerable plaque is very powerful in outcomes. But I feel we are late, no? As you're saying, like we come to the cat lab, these patients had already had an MI, they are presenting with a STEMI, we do imaging everywhere, and everywhere there is vulnerable plaque everywhere. So we are late already. And then uh, putting a stents everywhere is going to change the outcome, we are late. So with this uh, CT algorithm you're showing, I do CTs myself, like I do like 25, 30 studies every week. And you see these young patients, 20, 30, Taiwan diabetes, that come just because they have risk factors and they have these fissures of vulnerable plaques. So I think in the next years, we are going to be doing a lot of invasive imaging, but the future, future, future will be doing cardiac CT in patients with risk factors and we'll be coming way earlier than what we are coming now because we are going to target those patients, maybe not for interventions because we are, are, are going to be coming earlier than expected. And probably at that point, we will have the chance to do a statins and PCA screen I which is hard now, it's like a certain PCA's K9 when the patients are full of vulnerable plaques that have luminal stenosis already. So I think that's the very, very far future. We will do it more non-invasive, the software for CT and, and detection of vulnerable plaque and a CT, FFR and everything is going to be developed so much more in the next few years. And we will be coming earlier, like in the, in the spectrum of the coronary artery disease, will be coming earlier to treat the patients. Yeah, that, that's maybe why also we find in the studies of the FFR that the, um, the predictive value of FFR um, is different first in, in, in every artery, mostly comparing LAD to non-LAD, but also the predictive value is low. It's not that high. And it's the explanation it's been very clear by Greg Stone, and um, uh, that's that's very important guess because the studies of Colette and and, uh, and also from Collison and from all of those are very clear to show that. So Carlos, eh, ¿qué, eh, qué futuro le encuentras con esto a la tomografía para guiar pacientes con eh, factores con altos factores de riesgo y sobre todo yo un grupo que encuentro, además de los diabéticos, que encuentro muy importante y ahora Greg nos dirá también eh, su, su sentir en esto, es el grupo de pacientes que tienen antecedentes familiares uh -huh. antes de los 35 años. You, ¿Did you get that, Greg? No. No, ok. So, before 35 years old, a patient with a family history has a strong chance of developing atherosclerosis. Uh, I'm asking Carl first and then you, which is your vision to do a preventing CT as, as uh, Dr. Um, Brownwell said in the past uh, about that first color? Uh, sí, yo uh, no sé si puedo responder en español o en inglés. No, sé si, sí. uh, no yo, yo creo que esto abre, abre una, una puerta nueva interesante eh, en, en tratar de, de predecir eh, aquellos pacientes que están en más riesgo, ¿no? Eh, poder como coger ese target de pacientes de alto riesgo, sobrepeso, sedentarios, etcétera, etcétera, eh, y poderles hacer un CT y, y, y a partir de ese CT 
planear qué tanto se puede ser agresivo y meterlos en estas nuevas moléculas para tratar de regresar el, el, eh, y bajarles. Y, y, y como dice el doctor Greg Stone, eh, ese, ese volcano, tratar de pacificar ese, ese volcano. Yo creo, yo creo que ese, ese, ese es, un, es un área muy interesante que se está abriendo. Eh, yo, yo, yo no sé si puedo hacer una pregunta al doctor Greg Stone. Uh, Greg, I, I have a question to ask you. Do, do you think that this, you know, with, with this enlightening uh, presentation that you gave us, do you think that this might uh, be the, the open door for the near infraspec near, near infra infrared spectrum spectro spectroscopy? Uh, I mean, the, the, the rebirth of of this new techno of, of this technology that we have heard before in, in you know in lab trials. Do you believe right, that this well, could be a commercial? You know, the, I mean, the near infrared spectroscopy, which right now is available coupled with intravascular ultrasound, is a very powerful tool to identify lipid. Uh, and it's very simple. It's un unlike virtual histology, which was very difficult to read those images. This is either red or yellow. It's like a stoplight. It's go or stop. Uh, and when you get, And it gives you a number. And it even so it tells you through the number, is it a lot of lipid or a little bit of lipid? Uh, and we think 325 is the correct correct amount, where if you also have a lot of plaque and a, and a lot of lipid with a max LCBI 4mm of 325 or greater, that's a really worrisome plaque. What we need now is, um, uh, you know, again, data from larger randomized trials to show that when you find one of those plaques, you should go ahead and treat it. Uh, specifically, either with pharmacologic intensification or I believe a drug eluting stent or scaffold would work very, very well to passivate those plaques. And you can see even in Prospect 2, even with a first generation suboptimal BVS scaffold, we had what was approximately a 60% reduction in target lesion related MACE in a very healthy Scandinavian population. In uh, Latin America or the United States or Western Europe, those event rates would probably be double uh, what we saw in Prospect 2, especially if the pharmacologic therapy in the background is not so great. So we're just waiting now, big randomized trials. Um, SJ Park is doing one such study in South Korea. It's 1,600 randomized patients. He's recruited it. Um, it's probably not large enough. We probably, we powered it. You need about three or 4,000 patients to really be powered, but that will be the first vulnerable plaque um, outcome study that gets reported. Um, there's another small one that's gonna start soon that Elvin Ketty is doing, but that's gonna be too small. So, so far industry has been um, reluctant to fund a large vulnerable plaque outcomes trial because of, frankly speaking, the plummeting price of drug eluting stents um, around the world. They're finding it harder to support research, which is a real shame. Uh, but um, I'm very confident that the right thing to do is to treat these lesions, but I can't recommend it until we have those outcomes trials. Thank you. Do you have a, a Jose Luis or uh, Alfaro, do you have any comment? First of all, I want to thank Dr. Professor Stone for being here with us here in, in, in Sosime Solas. It's a great pleasure to have, us, to have you here with us today. And uh, I, your, your talk was excellent. Uh, we have many topics to, for reflection and that, uh, after listening to you. But one of them is that uh, us interventional cardiologists have been criticized for treating what uh, is supposed to be non-significant lesions many times. And probably we were right. I mean, sometimes we are treating lesions that uh, seem to be non-significant, but at the end, they happen to be uh, a plaques with a lot of uh, uh, plaque burden and, and with a uh, thin cap fibrotoroma. So we were probably right. What I believe is that uh, given the fact that in the near future, we will have uh, high resolution uh, CT scans for, to see the, the arteries and to plan the strategy and to decide beforehand if we are treating the lesion or not. So uh, things are going to change, but uh, it's only a comment that I wanted to tell you. And thank you again for your excellent presentation. I'm so happy. And, and Alfaro, what, what, where do you think that we're treating with uh, small pieces of uh, sickness and illness with stents of a uh, complete inflammatory and systemic disease? tratemos solo una parte? El doctor Stone quiere. Adelante. El doctor Stone quería que hiciera. ¿Do you want to say something, Greg? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, did you want me to answer that question? Uh, uh, yeah, please go. Yeah, well, it, it's, uh, you know, there's, there's no doubt that we should be trying to treat the underlying systemic disease. I mean, the, the patient who's got oxidative stress and ongoing inflammation that, that tends to cause the development of atherosclerosis and progress atherosclerosis, of course, we should be treating that. Uh, the question is, what happens, though, when you get one of these really well-formed vulnerable plaques that then places kind of an imminent risk um, on the artery? And they're not all over the coronary tree. Um, on average, you know, in both prospect one and prospect two, uh, um, most patients had one vulnerable plaque somewhere else. Sometimes they had two or three, sometimes they had zero. But on average, they have four plaques uh, somewhere else, and one of them tend to be a vulnerable plaque. So they're not all over. And so we make the analogy of, uh, of you know, for example, um, uh, a cavity right? You want to use fluoride in the toothpaste to prevent cavities and do good preventative therapy, but when you get a cavity, you probably need to treat it. Um, uh, and, and if you're starting to see a cavity develop, you want to treat it earlier rather than later. Thank you, Dr. Stone. Excellent conference. Eh, voy a, uh, me gustaría a mí hablar de, de la parte clínica, o sea, la, las imágenes son espectaculares, el, tema de la placa vulnerable, eh, eh, tiene muchos, mucho tiempo de estarse hablando y con estas herramientas que tenemos ahora podemos guiar más, me, mucho mejor el tratamiento. Pero lo que sí quisiera dejar acá es el, el, el mensaje de que además de esto, no hay que olvidar la importancia del manejo médico óptimo. Eh, hay que seguir estos pacientes porque sí es cierto, hay muchos pacientes con, con placas vulnerables que y te queda la duda si debes tratarlos o no tratarlos. Pero lo que no debemos olvidar nunca es que el paciente debe tener terapia apropiada de lípidos, no ajustar hacia la baja los lípidos porque el nivel de colesterol bajó, que eso lo vemos bastante en un médico clínico que no entiende el concepto, eh, preocuparse mucho por el control de factores de riesgo como diabetes, que muchas veces se descuiden, nos vamos nada más a la parte anatómica coronaria y nos olvidamos a la parte clínica, los hipertensos, eh, un, pro, un buen programa de rehabilitación, ejercicio, etcétera. Esto complementa, por supuesto, el manejo que hagamos en la sala de movimientos. Eh, por experiencia, eh, los pacientes que yo manejo, y luego de 25 años de experiencia, si uno hace todo esto, es muy, pro, muy poco probable que lleguen con un síndrome coronario agudo por una placa inestable. Pero sí lo veo cuando le corresponde el seguimiento a un, a un internista, a un cardiólogo clínico que no tiene muy claro los conceptos. Entonces yo, yo quiero enfatizar de que no debemos olvidar que como complemento el tratamiento médico óptimo sigue estando ahí y estas herramientas lo que nos ayudan a llevar un mejor manejo y una mejor estratificación y probablemente tener eh, seguir más de cerca a estos pacientes de alto riesgo. Um, uh, I have to end the session, uh, but I want to thank you once again, Greg and Natalia and everyone here for being here and for enlightening us with a great conference. I'm pretty much that uh, assured that in the future, CT will play a significant, important role in detecting now that we are lowering thresholds of uh, radiation and also uh, giving us also physiological information, especially in patients with uh, some kinds of inheritance of uh, atherosclerotic disease and heavy risk factors. And um, also, the technology is going to lead us to treat a different uh, approach in this kind of patient, especially in patients with acute coronary syndromes and not related uh, arteries. And uh, it, this talk has been great to point out the limitations, not only of angiography, also of uh, Physiology, I'm a very good fan of physiology, but it has also limitation as every tool we have. But we have to integrate all of those and uh, to have more than two eyes uh, placed on the patient to treat them properly. Thank you very much, Gretchen. Th thank you very much to everyone. Thank you, everyone.